I'm delighted to be back for our second study in John's first epistle. I am sure that you all read through the letter as a whole, preparing for this all all last night or all day yesterday, and have even memorized portions of the book together. Well, if not, uh, uh, open your Bibles now to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to move ahead, and we're going to look at the first three verses, some of the greatest verses in the Bible. 1 John 3, beginning at verse 1. John writes, Behold what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Amen. Father, I thank you again for all my friends with Rafiki, particularly those overseas, but also those in Orlando and other places. We're sad we can't be together for enrichment, but Father, your word is not bound, and so it goes forth now. Would you bless it? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The third chapter of First John starts the second main section of his letter. So yesterday we looked at maybe the key verse of chapter of the first section, chapters one to two. And now we jump into the second section of the book. And he began with an emphasis in the previous section on fellowship with God and the importance of preserving it through godly morality, love and fellowship, and sound doctrine. Now his theme is shift now, and it's concerned with this section with the implications of the new birth. A Christian has been born again. Well, what are the implications of that? And he actually anticipated this. John, by the way, likes to overlap his sections. And if you back up a little bit, when he was talking about the Antichrist in chapter 2, 18 to 28, that whole section, he said they went out from us, but they were not of us, meaning they possessed a different spiritual nature. So he's, he's had this in mind, this whole issue of the implications of a new nature. And of believers, he said in verse 29 of chapter 2, everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And that's the formal transition to the second section, which begins in chapter 3, the implications of the new birth. And John's going to discuss this from the first verse of chapter 3 to chapter 4, verse 6. Now, another way to describe the shift in the letter is to say that this second section focuses on the inner spiritual life of the believer. Martin Lloyd-Jones paraphrases John to put it this way, I want you to realize that as a result of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not only in fellowship with God, but you have also become children of God. You are born of God. You're not only in a new relationship in an external manner, there is a vital internal relationship. It's not merely that you're having communion and uh, association with God, but that you are in vital union with him. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. Well, John begins chapter 3 by telling us what we are then because of the new birth. And one of the marvelous statements that we have here has an echo in his gospel. We often, when you're studying First John, you often think, wow, it's kind of like what he said in the gospel. That's not surprising. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. Now, before he works out the implications, what does the new birth mean to us experientially? He first wants us to fill our hearts with wonder over the source of our new life. I've always loved how the King James Version puts it. Behold what manner of love. Now John wants us to take a moment and to contemplate the enormity and the marvel of our salvation. And he says we are God's children because of his love that surpasses our imagination. Now what kind of love is this? Behold, what manner of love, he asks. Well, it's divine love for the unworthy and the unlovely. It's God's love who was willing to send his son to the cross in order to save us. And that God has bestowed his love on us means, John Calvin says, that it is from mere bounty and benevolence that God makes us his children. Isaac Watts wrote, Behold the amazing gift of love the Father hath bestowed on us the sinful sons of men to call us sons of God. 
Now, John uses the Greek word patapos in asking what manner of love. And, and that term always conveys a sense of astonishment. It's not a mere question. It's an astonished question. And it's the same word the disciples used when Jesus was on the boat in the storm and he, he stilled the winds and the wave and the disciples said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and, and waves obey him? It's the same word, Ma Matthew eight twenty seven. Interestingly, its original meaning was from what country? That's the actual, uh, if you put the word together, it's from what country? And we're to imagine a ship sailing into harbor uh, slowly coming into view as it draws near. And the excited people, they strain to see what kind of ship it is, where it's from, and they want to see what its trim is, what its banner is, from what country. And see, that's the excitement that John feels, asking us to behold what manner of love that comes from heaven. Ian Hamilton writes, Truly, God's love for sinners is out of this world. It's undeserved, unsought, and freely given. Now, God's love looks upon rebellious sinners and through the sacrifice of his son, God makes us into his own children, his beloved children. And there's three ways when we, we should think about being children of God. It's a hugely important subject. And so if we're a child of God, what does that mean? Well, there's three ways we should think of it. First of all, we have received a new legal status. We are no longer enemies of God. We are not even mere servants, but we have been made children in God's family. Uh, you often see this emphasis in the Apostle Paul, and, and you see it in John's statement that, that we should be called the children of God, that we should have the status of children of God. You see, you see God has filled out the adoption papers. He signed it with the red ink of Christ's blood. And as a result, secondly, we receive privileges as God's children. Now, these privileges are God's fatherly care, our access to his presence in prayer, God's loving discipline to make us holy, uh, the inheritance in glory that is yet to come when Christ returns. These are our privileges. Now, John's main thought in this passage, however, concerns the third way we should think about being children of God. We have received a new nature that enables us to know God. We, we bear the family likeness. It's probably for this reason that he uses the generic children Rather than Paul's tendency to use the term sons, when Paul says sons, we shouldn't turn that into, into gender neutral because it conveys the idea of inheritance, the, the sons who inherit. I, I like to say to the women, uh, we get to be the bride of Christ and you get to be the sons of God. But here, children is what he says. It, it's more general and it's speaking about uh, the nature we receive. God has given his love to us. He's bestowed his love on us, indicating that it's in a living way that God has given us his love. Now, we don't choose our earthly parents, but we are the results of their shared love. And likewise, we are God's children as a result of the love that he expressed through the ministry of his son, a love that comes to us through the new birth by the Holy Spirit. God has shown his love for us, in calling us to be his children, but then he's bestowed his love to us and even in us uh, when we are born again. And Terry Johnson makes the application of the implication. He says, being a Christian is no mere intellectual exercise. One does not affirm a creed just to join the organization. No, God's seed is planted in our souls. We are given a new nature. Well, children of God is John's answer to what it means when a sinner believes in Jesus Christ. And he insists on this new identity, and so we are. That is what we are. Behold what manner of love it is, that we should be called the children of God, so we are, verse 1. You see, if we would only think about it, he suggests, it would put an end to all our discontentment, all our worry and anxiety. God sent his son to become man and to die an agonizing death for our sins, also that we might be forgiven, that we might become his beloved dear children. Now, in this life, very sadly, we often learn, even from our parents, that if we want to be loved, if we ever want to be accepted, we have to become good enough, according to some standard. And many Christians, I think, for that 
reason, because of past experiences. And many Christians think that way about God, and so they're ceaselessly trying to do enough to feel sure of their salvation. One of the things they often do is go to the mission field. Uh, but, but we don't need to do something to be sure that we're accepted by God, that he loves us. Uh, John says this, it, this is the meaning here. He says, your salvation begins with God's love in the new birth, and he has made you his children forever. Now, all that we do for God, everything that we do, will never earn his acceptance. It's merely the way we thank him for his unfailing gift of love. Now, God's sovereign initiative in our adoption is emphasized when John says that God called us. See, it was, it was a work of God. He was the initiator. It was his will. John Calvin says, It is God who with his own mouth declares us to be sons. We did not persuade him, but rather he called us. And Paul similarly wrote that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. Now, as such, our adoption as God's children is permanent and irrevocable. Uh, just as uh, our legal status is as unalterable as God's children, so also by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, we eternally are the children of God. We eternally have a new nature. Now, it probably needs to be said, and it should be obvious, that the Bible rejects the false teaching that says that God is everyone's father. Everyone's a child of God, whether they believe or not. Well, you can use that language in a generic sort of way. We are his offspring, Paul said in Acts 17. But a father-child love relationship belongs only to those who are born again to faith in Jesus. John wrote in his gospel, John 1, 11 and 12, to all who received Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. It is only those born again to a living faith in Jesus who are the children of God. Now, John's concern in all of this is not merely doctrinal. The doctrine is very important, but he does have a practical concern. And to this end, then, the second point he makes, his first point is, what are we? We're God's children. What manner of love is that? What are the implications of that? But then he also goes on and he points out the experience that we have now in this present age of the world. We are the children of God. What now? We've been reconciled to God. But now the effects of our rebirth are, being taken, are taking place. And one of them, he says, is that we are alienated from the world. Verse 1, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So there's the bad part of the bad news. You're accepted by God forever. He loves you, but the world will not love you generally. Now, as John puts it, the, the Christian is a mystery to the world. And that's one of the reasons we're so routinely misunderstood. And, and the thinking goes like this. If you really were God's child, well, shouldn't you manifest earthly power, wealth, and vitality? And yet so often we're the most humble, the most oppressed, the weakest of all people. That's the way the ancient world thought of Israel. If they really had the true and living God as their God, shouldn't Israel be the great imperial power instead of Babylon or Egypt or Assyria? Now, earthly princes, princes are known by their rich garments, by their train of servants. They, they go through this life kind of floating through with an air of splendor. But Christians... Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 7, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Well, given that situation, the world reasons, why would anyone want to be a Christian, giving up the pleasures of sin and then bearing the reproach of Christ? Well, John explains the world's dismay over Christians by pointing out that it did not know him, that is, Jesus. The world did not know Christ. Despite his marvelous teaching, his incredible miracles, he even raised the dead, Jesus had a remarkably small following during his earthly ministry. We should never be dismayed if our faithful labors have produced what seems to be a small amount of numerical fruit. Uh, Jesus' ministry did too. It turned out all right. Uh, when Pontius Pilate offered to show mercy to Christ, the people actually chose a criminal to be spared over him. 
And Jesus said, if they persecute me, they will also persecute you, John 15, 20. Well, John notes that Christians experience our adoption in this world, in that kind of setting. He said, beloved, we are God's children now. Even now, even in this world, with all that we just said, misunderstood, disliked, persecuted, we now are God's children. The mountains don't bring forth sound. They don't bring, break forth in song when we walk by. The, the trees do not clap their hands at our approach. Uh, that's the way Isaiah said they will someday. Isaiah 55, 12, doesn't go on now. The world does not acknowledge our high condition. And so Christians should not be surprised when the secular media misrepresents our views, when neighbors whisper behind our backs. I, I, I came from a non-Christian family, and a wonderful family in many ways, in most ways. But uh, we were not evangelicals. I remember my dear mother before, she was converted at the end of her life, but I remember as, a, as an adolescent, and she would say, those people are evangelicals. We want to avoid them. John, John Mitchell writes, in many ways, Christians are a thorn in the flesh to those leaders who wish to bring in a world dominion without God. By the way, that's why the Roman Empire persecuted the Christians. They're trying to bring in utopia. They're trying to bring in the world domination. Christians aren't with the program. If the world had no place for Christ, it will have no place for us. Well, not only are Christians misunderstood by the world, but as John puts it, we are presently a disappointment even to ourselves. Look at verse 2. He points out what we will be has not yet appeared. In the present, we're like rough and unfinished construction projects, often with broken pieces falling around our feet. Uh, you think, I think of in Africa, every building project has rebar sticking up from it. Well, so are our present lives. And so with what pastoral insight does John continue? He says, what we will be has not yet appeared. Now, this is a book that is largely focused on assurance, and he's charged us to live lives of godliness, love, and truth. And we inevitably look at ourselves with alarm, and we see so many ways that we fall short. And so he points out we are not yet what we will be. Yes, a Christian knows an inward pull towards godliness, love, and truth, but the present reality is we still lose our tempers, we cover what belongs to others, we gossip about friends, we fall into error. Now, John's not endorsing those things. He merely acknowledges it. He said in verse 8 of chapter 1, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We are a disappointment, certainly to one another, but even to ourselves. So Christians are not only a mystery to the world, we are a mystery to ourselves. How, how can I have these sinful desires when I've been born again? How can I be so selfish and unloving if I have union with Christ? Well, John knows we ask these questions, and so he reminds us, Beloved, we are God's children now. And because that's so, his assessment can be reversed. He says what we will be, we are not yet. But that also means that what we are not yet, we will be. What we are not yet, we will be. We're traveling a road that is God's blood-bought children, led by the Holy Spirit, guided by Scripture, is going to lead us to a glory prepared from the foundation of the world. Yes, our experience now includes the world's disdain, our own disappointment. But you see, this experience in Christ is going to end, as the Bible puts it, with us shining like stars in the brightness above. Daniel 12, 3, and Matthew 13, 43. Harriet Buell wrote, I once was an outcast stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down, an heir to a mansion, a robe, and a crown. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the king. Well, it's to this inheritance that John then turns as he encourages us on our heavenward journey. What are we? We are now God's children. What is our experience? Well, we have the new life in us, but we're misunderstood, not that popular, disappointing to ourselves. But then he turns to the future, and this is one of the most soaring sentences in all of God's word. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. 
So he's pointed out our present challenging experience, but he highlights that we still know some things, and the things that we know keep us going. At first, we know that even now that we are the children of God. Uh, Lloyd-Jones says we will never be more the children of God than we are now. You are either a child of God or you are not. And once you are a child of God, you are forever and ever going to be in that divine and eternal relationship. But there's something else we know. We know I'm not, I'm not that impressive. I know, but, but I'm a child of God. But we secondly know that my Savior is coming back and he's going to bring us into glory. He's returning in power to overthrow all evil, to judge the living and the dead. He's going to mention that in the verses that follow this. His people are going to be raised in glorified bodies in order to live forever in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, Colossians 1, uh, three and, uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 4 speak similarly. Your life is hidden with God in Christ. You see, it doesn't appear to be this way, but this is the truth. We know this is true. And he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, we further know, we know that we're the children of God. We know he's coming soon. soon. We also know that when he appears, verse 2, we shall be like him. You see, what we are not yet, we will be when Jesus comes back. Our bodies will raise, rise from the grave at the call of the Lord. Uh, Paul says we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one to 52 Our bodies even will be glorified to reflect the radiance of glory that was seen in Jesus' own resurrection body. P people say, what will our bodies be like after we're raised? Like Jesus' body. When you read at the end of the Gospels, we will have that glory. Now, most significantly, when Christ returns, believers will experience not only the glorification of our bodies, but also the glorification of our spirits. We will be made holy just as Jesus is holy. And God's purpose has always had that end in view, that we would be conformed to the image of his Son, Romans 8.29. And in this present life, our lives are about the work of sanctification. That's the, the process of our becoming more holy is God's main work in our lives now. We're called to put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, Colossians 3.10. And you see, when Christ returns, this present process, painful, sometimes very powerful, sometimes disappointing, it seems, but it will be completed, he says. It will come to a sudden completion. Paul describes the, come, the second coming as the revealing of the sons of God. Romans 8, 19. Charles Wesley wrote, Change from glory into glory, till, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before him, lost in wonder, love, and praise. But there's more, for John concludes, we shall see him as he is. Now, this life has a lot of incredible sights to see. You've probably seen a lot of them. There's the Grand Canyon, one of my favorites. There's the Soaring Alps. There's the Great Rift. For those of you in Kenya, I've been there. There's a, there's a beautiful sight of a bride walking down the aisle toward us in her white dress. Well, that's a sight to see. My oldest son was just married, just got the photographs last night of his bride and in his, the tears in his eyes. What a sight that was for him. But there's nothing, my friends, that will compare with what we will see in the world to come. We will see the Son of God as he is in all of his glory in the unveiled fullness of his deity. And John Paul contrasts this future privilege with our present inability, 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve. For now we see as in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. For now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Well, the Bible often teaches that we must be sanctified in order to see God's face. Jesus taught, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, 8. And Hebrews 12, 14 urges us to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, these verses teach the importance of sanctification in this life and the necessity of perfect holiness in the life to come. But you see, John adds some information here, that it is the vision of Christ that will affect 
our spiritual perfection. When he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. Now, this is the ultimate process, ultimate fulfillment of the process by which right now we're being transformed by contemplating Jesus in his glory and grace. Now, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, we all with unveiled faith, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We see on that day we will see him as he is, and we will be transformed uh, at, at the end. We, our sanctification will come to perfection. You know, isn't it true we always become more and more like the object of our worship? And in the sight of Christ, as he is, we shall be made like him, children of God, revealed in the glory prepared for us from eternity past. In July 1994, Brian Kelly received news that because of a failed operation, he was going to die very soon. And he worked for a fireworks company. And he gave his family some unusual instructions. His body was to be cremated, and his ashes were to be rolled into a 12-inch fireworks scroll, a, 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 shell, a fireworks shell. I'm going to assume that's the biggest one, a 12-inch shell. His ashes were placed there. And a month later, a rocket went up at a pyrotechnic convention. And it burst in the air as Brian Kelly's ashes mingled with red and green stars for four glorious seconds. And so it is for everyone who lives now apart from Jesus. David Allen writes, Without Christ, no matter how long or short a life we live, no matter whether uh, we make it in this life or not, that's, that is all there is. A few seconds of glory, then everything flickers and fades into darkness. But those who know Christ will one day be with Jesus and will become like Jesus. The Bible says we will shine as the stars forever and ever with him. Well, the closest anyone has come to seeing Jesus as he is took place on the Mount of Transfiguration. When three of Jesus' closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, they saw the Lord, Matthew 17, 2, transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. Now, Peter, you remember, wanted to stay on the mountain. He, he made booths in which the three of them could hang out and shelter. But, but Jesus took them back down the mountain where the trials and challenges still awaited them. And that's how it is for us as we now contemplate the future glory. We still live in a world that does not know us. The future holds this incredible blessedness. What does the present hold? It holds hope. Ours a hope is, our hope is made certain by the promise of God. It, our hope is anchored behind the veil, held fast by the unbreakable covenant of the Lord. Well, here's the question. How do we then hope? That's how we conclude it. What are we? We're children of God. Uh, even now, it doesn't look like it. We're kind of disappointing. What we will be, we're not. But he's coming back, and then we're going to be like him. We will see him as he is. What do we do now? We hope. That's what he says. And the way that we hope, here's what he says. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. 1 John 3.3. 3. That's what our hope does. It causes us to be zealous about our sanctification. You see, John reasons if we only saw with crystal clarity what it is that is our desired destination, and if we place it in our heart, hope will energize the realization now of what's going to be then. It's like a bride who knows her groom is on the way to the church, even now, and we will devote ourselves then to preparing a beauty that is suitable for the occasion. David Jackman puts it this way, if heaven is a destination, we must be traveling the road that leads there. That road is called sanctification, the process that John says purifying ourselves, conforming our lives to the pattern of Christ increasingly. Now, we normally think of our sanctification as a negative thing. We're turning away from sin, and certainly that's true. But notice how positive he is. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, John already said in the verse we looked at yesterday that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all our sins. But now the Holy Spirit purifies us inwardly, and we're to be active participations in that sanctification. Yes, we mortify our sinful desires. We starve the sins that we would yield to. But we also purify our 
affections, our heart, to honor God with our minds and bodies. Uh, the Christian says, I am going to be like Christ then. I want to be more like him now. Whether it's the way that we talk, our sexuality, the way we use our time, the way we use our money, we will endeavor to please the Lord. And he is pure. That's our standard and our goal. And the knowledge that we're destined to be like him gives us confidence that we can be more that way now. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus said, for they shall see God. You see, if I'm a believer in Jesus, then John marvels at the love that calls me a child of God. And, and so we are, he confirms. And that means I'm going to see Jesus as he is. And that means I will be pure uh, like him. And you see, if this is my hope, sure and certain on the foundation of God's promise, then I will purify myself now by the grace of God that comes through his word and prayer. The Scottish reformer Samuel Rutherford believed in Christ's return, and he earnestly prepared for that by cultivating a personal holiness. And the world did not understand him, but his vision of Christ's glory grew as his heart became more and more pure. Well, the year 1660 saw a, re a restoration of the Stuart monarchy in Scotland, and the Stuarts began trying to control the church and Rutherford began to resist the, 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 the king's control of the church. And so he was put in prison, and after a year of confinement, he was sentenced to death. But the officials, when they came to him, found that he was already sick on his deathbed. Rutherford actually says, I'm sorry, I cannot go with you. I have a prior engagement. But there on his deathbed, he reveled in the coming approach of glory. And he said to his gathering friends, my Lord and Master is chief of ten thousands of thousands. None is comparable to him in heaven or on earth. Dear brethren, do all for him. Pray for Christ. Preach for Christ. Do all for Christ. Beware of men-pleasing. And then just as he was slipping into death, Rutherford's last words were softly heard. Glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Anne Ross Cousin made these dying words of Rutherford the basis of a hymn that celebrates the destiny of everyone who is a child of God in the glory that one day is going to be, and the hope of which quickens our desire to be purified now. Here's what she wrote. The king there in his beauty without a veil is seen. It were a well-spent journey, though seven deaths lay between. The Lamb with his fair army doth on Mount Zion stand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Amen. God bless you. Father, I pray for uh, everyone with Rafiki. I, I pray for all my friends there, some I don't know, but uh, how blessed they are to, to you, how you are their father and you love them. I pray that you would now take this passage, you apply it to their hearts uh, for comfort, Lord. I cause them to be encouraged in their difficulties. They're your children now. Uh, help to give them the zeal, the excitement, Lord, that I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to see him as he is. And then, Lord, I pray that they and I both would really prepare for Jesus' coming with a sincere commitment, not in order to, to cause you to accept us. You, you accept us in Christ as a way of saying thank you to you and a way of preparing ourselves to give our love to Jesus when he comes. Let us pure ourselves, purify ourselves, even as he is pure. Thank you. God bless you. And uh, I'll look back, look forward to tomorrow's lesson, which is going to be at the end of 1 John. Thank you.